All right, let's sing one more song of praise to the Lord. This one is called Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. It's a classic hymn that I'm sure we all know. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him for he is thy health and salvation. Praise him in God adoration. Praise to the Lord who are all things so wondrously reigning. Shelters you under his wings and so suddenly sustaining. Have you not seen how all your longings have been? Granted in what he ordained. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the to the Lord who does prosper your work and defend you. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend you. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he be Joyful, joyful. Sing yet not I, but through Christ in me.
the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been This next song is Rock of Ages. Thank you. 
everybody, and welcome to Quail Lake Church Online. It's Easter Sunday, and we're so excited to be able to be with you today. And if you're not able to be with us on our campus, we're, you know, we're meeting at 6.30 in the morning on Easter Sunday, and then at 9 o'clock as well. You know, you're, we'd love to have you come on out, but we want to give you the same message that you're going to hear right here at Quail Lake Community Church. And one of the things we're going to do is that I'm going to stand before the crowd that's there, and I'm going to do a traditional kind of a, kind of a, a back and forth thing with them. And what I do is I'll go, he is risen. And then they'll all come back to me and go, he is risen indeed. So right where you are, let's do this together. He is risen. You can say he is risen indeed. It's Easter. It's a wonderful day. You know, I wrote a devotional. I do devotionals and put them on Facebook. And, and uh, this week I had an encounter with uh, the manager at an In-N-Out that I go to, In-N-Out Hamburgers. And we got into a conversation. I guess he saw me and came over and just said hi. And, and he said, hey, did you see the sign that we had out here that we're going to be closed on Sunday? And I said, no, I didn't see it. He said, but we didn't say that we were going to be closed on Easter. And I thought, ah, oh, okay. He says, on our store, it says, we're going to be closed on Resurrection Day. I like that because that's what it is. Easter or Resurrection Day is so important that people stopped worshiping on the day they used to go to church on. It used to be the Sabbath. Now, people who have maybe are not as familiar with the Bible, Sunday, uh, they think Sunday is the Sabbath. You hear that in the old movies, you know, well, remember today is the Sabbath. No, it isn't. No. Saturday is the Sabbath, according to the Bible. But people who chose to worship and follow this Jesus began to worship then on Sunday. Because they called it, it's a Lord's, Lord's day. He bought it. He got it. You see, Christianity doesn't exist without the resurrection. No resurrection, no Christian faith. So I'm going to tell you what I've given my life to. And today, you're going to leave our, our time together today believing it's truth or it's a lie. And you know what the good news is for you? Everybody gets a choice. Everybody gets a choice. But what does the Bible say about that Sunday? And let's start. We're going to be looking at John chapter 19 here. And it goes this way. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Now, we're going to stop right there. That's the introduction. That that's what's happening in the very beginning of Easter Sunday. Now, Jesus, remember, in this Easter week, he's come to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Great parade, awesome celebration. And then it ends up on Friday with crucifixion. He's executed. He's dead. He's put into a tomb. They had to rush it because the Sabbath was crowding in on them. Now, the typical family response when somebody died was that you would wait seven days before you visited the grave site. That was just the tradition. Now, we find Mary, and with the other gospel accounts, understand there are other women who came with her, who came to the tomb, that they were rushing around to get the job of preparing Jesus' body for burial, and, and they didn't get to finish it. But people did come in that three-day window, they said, and in the research I did, and so there's nothing that we see in this scripture that's out of step with the times and traditions of the day. So Mary, well, she's cheating a little bit here and heading out to the tomb. Now, remember, she's living in a time when artificial light's a, a rare commodity. So she starts off, it says, before it's even, even light. And she gets to the tomb in that early morning light. And the tomb is open. The guards who were stationed there, they're gone. And she looks around. And there's nobody home. Now, she must have peeked in because she runs back to find the disciples, Peter and John. And she tells them, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. Nobody knows. Nobody knows where they've taken him. Now, they had to be saved. After all of this, how we had the great celebration on the Sunday before. And now we're coming to this Sunday. And it's horrible. How can this get any worse? We've lost 
dead Jesus. So the account records two guys. Two guys then get up, and they start running to the tomb to check this next chapter out in the disaster that has fallen on all of them. And it was a confirmation of what had happened. It goes this way. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb, and they were both running. But the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they hadn't understood that the Scriptures said Jesus must rise from the dead. And then they went home. They went home. Well, these guys have to check it out for themselves. From the accounts, we figure John was younger than the two of them. And by now, it's going to be full light. They can easily run to the tomb. And John, this younger one, he's winning this foot race to get to the grave first. And then he's going to see what has happened here to Jesus. And he gets there first, and John doesn't go in. He comes up to this grave, and he peeks inside. Now, remember, this is a tomb. It's not this huge, massive room that are going to hold parties there and stuff. It's small. It has a little shelf in it, and that's where you put the body. And you roll this round stone in. It would take, you know, a number of men to push it back out. Because you didn't want people robbing graves in those days, and you know, desecrating remains, all that kind of stuff. And so... They see uh, the shelf where the body was laid, and there's no Jesus. But the wrappings are still there. The wrappings that they'd used to do a quick Jewish burial as, uh, as fast as they could on that day because they were not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And, and the scene is, though, when we look at the original language, that the wrappings are laying there as though the body had just passed through them. They just collapsed. So it isn't like a pile of it. It's just stuffed over in the corner, but when Jesus rose from the dead, he left what was holding him there on the shelf in the same place. Now, John is just standing at the, at the entrance, and he's looking in, but finally Peter catches up. Good old Peter, he blasts by his younger buddy, and he's standing in the tomb. He's actually inside, and he sees the wrappings, but he notices the cloth that covered Jesus' head. It is lying separate from everything else, and it is neatly folded and laying there. Now, John sees that Peter doesn't explode. He doesn't melt. He doesn't disappear or evaporate. He's just looking over this whole thing, so he goes in, too. They're taking it all in. And John comes in, and he looks, and he does something that is so key here. In that moment, he becomes the first person of all of humanity to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Peter, not so much yet. And that's important to us. Because here you have two men who look at the same scene, the same events leading up to this. They saw everything, heard all the things that Jesus said would happen to him. They've got all the info. They're both here looking at this, this, this kind of setting. But John, it says, he believed. And it says also that the scriptures had predicted all of this, that they didn't realize it, but, but it had been predicted that the scriptures have come true. What scriptures are we talking about? In the Old Testament, <clears throat> Psalm 16 goes like this, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Do you know how many years they've been reading that in their church services? 1,000 years. Over and over again. And then how about this one? Isaiah 53. This is a little longer. It says, he had done no wrong. Uh, he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, like Jesus. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him because, and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hand. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. And I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many 
and interceded for the rebels. Wow. You know how long ago that was before this day when they come to this empty grave? 700 years. They're reading this stuff in church for 700 years. You realize how long that is? We're not even to 250 years yet for the USA. You start talking about when the USA was uh, uh, first became a country. We go, wow, that was a long time ago. No, no. It's nothing compared to how long God had been letting them know what he was going to do. John believed. Peter, eh, not so much. Not yet. What do you think the difference was? You know, we got two guys here looking at the same thing. But what was it that allowed John to see what God had done to lock into those scriptures? It was his love. His love for Jesus. Now, I'm not saying Peter didn't love Jesus. Obviously, he did. But there was a deep love that John had that allowed him to see the facts that were there first. I'm not talking about making stuff up. The facts that he could see and interpret what God had done and what he was in the process of doing. That makes all the difference in the world. That's the key to this whole thing. So what do you do? When you look at the tomb, one believes, one not so much. He's going to get there. Don't worry. What do you do now? You go home. Let's go home. That's it. Nothing else to see here, folks. Break it up. Go home. Because, you know, we just talked about the love that was different that day between the two of them. We have one more person who was apparently at the tomb who came back. His love is even greater. And her name is Mary Magdalene. Mary had been freed from the demonic power of specific demonic uh, entities that had made her life just unlivable, unlivable. She just didn't want to live anymore, I bet. And Jesus freed her, pronounced forgiveness over her, and her life was changed. <clears throat> and unlike a lot of folks, she didn't forget what he had done for her. He had given her back her life. So the men leave, and Mary is left there, and she is just sobbing. And that's the third section here, the crying. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him, cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Uh, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord. And she gave them his message. Now, the way the account reads, she may not have really looked inside when she first came. I mean, not, she gave it a hard look because, you know, she saw there was no body in there. She decided to take another look when Peter and John had come in and, and, and seen and all that, that had gone on. But there was nothing else in the tomb when the two men looked. No one had been there. And on that shelf where the wrappings are still there, when she looks in, now there are two angels. One is sitting at one end of the shelf and one at the other end of the shelf. You go, all right, so what? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. It's significant because what she's seeing is something that only the high priest would see once a year in the Day of Atonement in the Jewish faith system. It was a box that was in the temple, and it was gold. And on the top of this box were two golden angels who sat, and they had their wings pointed towards the middle. And this was the place of atonement. The chest was the Holy of Holies in the temple, and it had two angels here. They were made of gold. They guarded this chest, if you will. 
Once a year, he would come and sprinkle blood on this, and it would be to atone for the sins of the people. Not fully forgiven, but their sins would be covered by this blood. And so what's happening is they're leaving a message for those who can understand what's going on here, not only for Mary, but for all of us. But that thing in the temple, the promise, that's all it was. It was a promise of something greater. And here in this graveyard is what it's pointing to. Forgiveness has been purchased, not by the blood of some poor animal that got whacked, but by God who came in the flesh, who purposely went to the cross to pay for our sins. And I love that the angels asked Mary, why are you crying? Well, Mary, I can imagine her kind of putting her hands on her hips and going, well, you know what, guys? Because it's been some terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days lately, partners. But they know what she doesn't get. That the resurrection has taken place. Jesus isn't dead. He's alive. But all she wants is the dead body to be put back in the grave. That's as far as she can imagine, as far as she can see, as far as she can understand. And then she turns, and it's Jesus who's behind her. And he asks her, why are you crying? She has to be thinking, doesn't anybody around here get this? What is taking place? And he asks her, who are you looking for? And maybe she's not looking up at him or something. And, and you know, but that's a good question. Who are you looking for, Mary? What did you come here looking for? Are you looking for dead Jesus? Or are you looking for live Jesus? Do you want teaching Jesus? Miracle Jesus? Jesus who makes bread and fish go a long ways, Jesus? The Son of God, Jesus, who's fulfilled what God had promised from the very beginning of the Bible. That's what you're looking for. And Mary's response is, I just want the body. Tell me where it is. I'll drag it back here where it's supposed to be. And then he says her name. Mary. And it's hearing him say her name that she knows it's Jesus. And she must have grabbed him like a uh, linebacker in the NFL because Jesus is gently uh, saying, hey, 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 hang on there. Yeah, you can't hold me here. <laughs> you know, now we're not, not talking about a sack here, hon. Uh, there's still work to be done. And he tells her, go. And tell my people. Tell my brethren that I need to go. But I'm going to be here for a bit because we're not done yet. And the reason is because God is going to give a whole spring of humanity the opportunity to join him and you and me in this eternal kingdom. So I can only imagine Mary must have slowly backed away thinking, oh gosh, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. And, and, and thinking, this is not what I thought was going to happen. You know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of that line out of Jaws. Do you remember Jaws? When the shark finally comes up, Sheriff Brody goes back, he sees Jaws. You remember the line he says? You're going to need a bigger boat. You're going to need a bigger boat. Because they're going to need a bigger understanding of who this is that they spent the last three years with. Saw savagely murdered on a cross. And now is whole and hearty and talking about a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And then there's a celebration. A celebration on this same day, Sunday. Verse 19, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And he spoke and showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, uh, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers in them. Place my hand in the wound in his side without Rome and speared him. Eight days later, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here. Look at my hand. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. My Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed. Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Well, we're still here on Easter Sunday. It's nice. The disciples are locked in because the religious leaders got Jesus. They're probably going to be next. And Jesus appears to them. He shows them his wounds, and they're convinced. They're filled with joy. They can hug him, touch him, you know, do the whole thing. <clears throat> there had to be some kind of a thing. He did it. He really did it. We saw him dead. He's alive. This is awesome. All of them, except for one. And his name is Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas now. But before we get too hard on him, you have to remember, Thomas is the guy that when Jesus was going into territory where the Pharisees wanted to kill him, you know what Thomas said? Come on, boys. Let's go with him. We'll die with him too. He was a tough guy. He's no coward. But he is a skeptic. Everybody else is jumping up and down and dancing the victory dance. He's saying, sorry, guys, not going to believe that till I see the nail. As a matter of fact, I'm going to stick my finger in him. I want to make sure that's really him. And I want to put my hand in where that spear was thrust in his side. I saw what that Roman did. Not going to join the party yet. It was eight days, eight days after Easter. The disciples are all together again. The doors are locked, and Jesus is standing among them. Here. He turns to Thomas. All right. Gas. Here you go. Stick your finger in my hand. Go ahead. Now put your hand on my side. Thomas didn't do that. He just crumples and cries out, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus says something to him that is so important to you and me today. Because here's where you get a leg up on all those disciples who were there, who saw him, who touched him, ate with him, did all those things. He says, you believe because you see me. But those who will not see me on this planet Earth and yet believe in me are blessed more than you can ever be. You have an advantage over those 11 guys who saw him. They got to see him. They got to speak with him. They got to touch him, eat with him, hear him. What he had to say after the resurrection. You're blessed. But they got to see. And they will pay for that privilege too. So what do we do with this? It's Easter. We got to go here. Well, wh wh where do we go from here? Well, first, we're going from despair to delight when we believe in the resurrection. That's what this whole story is. Starts off great. Goes to disaster, everything just, just collapses, and then the resurrection. Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, you may not remember him, but I remember living through Watergate scandal, and he was the attorney that uh, uh, represented uh, was Richard Nixon's personal attorney, I guess, in the midst of all of this. He was the guy that once said, I'd walk over my grandmother to reelect the president. He was a tough guy. He was a Marine captain and you know, all these things. Went to prison. It was part in Watergate. And there he met this Jesus. And he said this. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, put into prison. They wouldn't have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. Nothing was happening to them, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. Are you telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Impossible. Maybe you're saying today, never say it out loud, but feeling, I want to believe. I just can't do it. I'm like Thomas. I'd like to know joy in my life. I'd like to. To not be afraid of death. I'd like to know that God loves me and is real. You know what? God figured you'd be here today. Figured that you'd be struggling with that. Because right here in chapter 20, he gave us some verses 
that follow all of this resurrection story. It goes like this. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him you will have life by the power of his name. Go to the book. Go to the book. And let God tell his story. So as we close today, I want to ask you something. Have you ever done a DNA test? My mom did a DNA test. Everybody in her family was from Finland. Remember Finland? Arctic Circle, closest to where Santa is. Yep, that's it. Right there. Did a DNA test. Guess what she found out? Part of her family came from Italy somewhere or North Africa. Where did that come from? I saw a t-shirt the other day. It says, I took a DNA test, and God is my father. I love that. So the question is today, before we leave on this Easter Sunday, is who's your father? Who's your father? Remember Star Wars? Luke Skywalker got the shock of his life in Star Wars, and then the Empire strikes back. Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father. Do you remember that? No, you don't, because that's not the line. That's not what James Earl Jones decided that day when they did the filming. It's not the line he gave to Darth Vader. It is, no, I am your father. That was it. See, in Star Wars, Luke had no idea who his real father is. Darth Vader supposedly killed him. Darth Vader says, no, I'm your father. He had a vision that he was related to a great hero who died in battle, fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. But nope, this master of evil empire is his dad. That's who it is. <laughs> we need to be careful in this life. And Easter is a great day to bring the warning to us all again. To me, too. I mean, I'm in this with everybody else. You're not going to leave this planet alive. You know it? It's not going to happen. I know that. I'm playing fourth quarter ball right now. The clock's ticking. We've got to come to the grips of the reality that, yeah, life ends here on this earth. And you know what's going to happen? A guy told me once, <laughs> he looked, and I, I heard him say this. He said, we're going to take you out to a cemetery. We're going to put, throw you in a hole and put dirt on top of you. And then we're going to come back to the church and all eat potato salad. Yeah, that's it. I read something this week. It's all over the Internet. They did a survey of America just recently. And they asked if they believed that Jesus did bodily rise from the grave. Did Jesus in his body, not some kind of misty clouds like, you know, the Wizard of Oz kind of a thing, or like a rose from the dead. No, body, just like the Bible says. Can you guess from the survey how many Americans believe that Jesus rose bodily from the grave? Pick out a number. The number was 66%. You know what that means? Do the math. They said, and again, they didn't ask every American, but they said, we predict by our survey that out of every 100 people, 66 will agree that Jesus rose from the grave bodily on Easter. Yay! But there's something wrong with that. That's great that people are agreeing with the information in the Bible, but you know what that is? It's just information. You know what's coming up next? Have you done your taxes yet? Haven't done mine. Got to. If you ask Americans, do you believe you need to get your taxes in or at least paid by a certain time? You know what they'll say? I sure do. But what if you don't do them? What if you don't file them? Don't pay them? Well, you're going to be in a heap of trouble there. You see, just knowing your taxes are due isn't enough. You've got to do them. And it's the same thing with this Jesus of the Bible. It's not enough just to agree with what we just heard about today. 66% of Americans believe that Jesus bodily rose from the grave. Do you know what that should mean? That on some Sunday, some Sunday, all those folks ought to be in church. You know how many people will be going to church that day in America? 220 million people will attend church. That doesn't happen, does it? No. You see, the problem is God is not asking you just to agree with history. He wants you and me to reach out and take what that means, what all this means to us. The offer is there on the table for you and me, for every human.
Jesus died on the cross for every person who has ever lived or who will ever walk on planet Earth. And that death on Good Friday was payment for our sins before God. And all he asks is that we confess that we, what we already know. Our world's broken. We're broken. And we have an entire lifetime to be able to say just yes to him and accept the forgiveness and follow him. And if you do that, if you do that, when you end your journey here on planet Earth, you'll stand before God. And as you stand before God, and they ask you, you know, do you really belong here? And God, should this person really be here? And, you know, we think maybe we've got to kick them out of here. You'll hear God say to you, no, I am your father. And like on that first Easter Sunday, death will be swallowed up with life that has no end. And it's the life that you were always meant to live. And you finally have the opportunity to see it. Happy Resurrection Day. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You're a great God. We thank you for this wonderful Sunday, Resurrection Day, Easter. And Father, we thank you, too, for what you've given us. Give us the love and the eyes to be able to see the truth that is there. Father, not just to agree with it, as so many do, but Father, to act on it, to take advantage of it. Lord, I pray that anyone who's watching this today, who's not made that decision to accept your gift of forgiveness, Easter is an awesome day to do that. To just say, yes, Lord, I confess, I've sinned, I'm not perfect. And that, God, I need to be forgiven. Forgiven by you. And that Jesus died on the cross to forgive my sins. And I receive him now into my life. And I'm ready, ready to be on your team. Ready to call you my father. And you to call me your son, your daughter, your child. Thank you, Father, for that. And when you do that, God says, you did it. You did it. Now let's begin the journey that has no end. Thank you, God, for that. And thank you for each person watching today. And I pray that you'll bless them richly on this Easter Sunday. And that you'll fill their heart the joy and the knowledge and the love that Easter brings. Bless them richly, and we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus, who was dead and is now alive and is returning. Amen. Well, that's it for Easter Sunday. Thanks for being with us. Hope you have a great day, and remember that this Jesus who is alive, he loves you. We love you here, too, and we'd love to have you come out and be with us right here at Quail Lake Community Church any Sunday, except for Easter Sunday at 10 o'clock. Easter, if you are watching this and would like to come out, we'll be at 6.30 again or 9 a.m. in the morning. So again, God bless you all. And remember how truly, truly loved you all. We'll look for you next time. Have a great week. Goodbye for now. Hello, everyone. We are going to sing the song that we learned last week, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, which is a familiar tune, but we're going to do this newer version of it that we sang last time. So let's sing that together as we turn our eyes to Christ this morning. <laughs>